You probably know the passage in the canon where Ananda comes to see the Buddha and says, you know, half of this holy life we're leading, half of this practice, is having friendship with admirable people. And the Buddha says, don't say that. The whole of the practice is having friendship with admirable people. And this doesn't mean the other people can do the practice for you, but it means that it's having the right people around you, associating with the right people, that enables you to get on the path to begin with and to stay there. There's another passage where the Buddha says he doesn't see any external factor that's more helpful for awakening than friendship with admirable people. Of course, the primary example of the admirable friend is the Buddha himself. He's the example that sets up the challenge and claims that he can he was able to find true happiness, a happiness that wasn't dependent on conditions, through his own efforts. And simply keeping that claim in mind and looking at his the example of his teaching, the example of his behavior as it's recorded. And the examples of people who followed his teachings down through the centuries. It's important that you keep that in mind. Because it puts your life in a particular perspective. You can ask yourself, do you want to accept that challenge to see if it's true, or do you just want to turn your back on it? Or are you going to be very selective in thinking about it sometimes and hiding it away at others? It's a choice you've got to make. But it's best to keep it there in the background all the time, because it enables you to live your life to its highest capacity. We talk about getting the most out of life. Well, finding true happiness, that's certainly getting the most out of life. This is where we begin to see the importance of having genuinely admirable people as friends, because there are a lot of other theories about there, about what it means to get the most out of life. And they're spe especially strong in our society. We have a little box in our, in our houses, sometimes more than one box, that teaches us all kinds of weird things about where happiness lies and what kind of happiness is possible and what kind of happiness is desirable. And you have to ask yourself, are those boxes, TVs, radios, computers, are they your friends or not? When you hang around with them, what kind of friends are you hanging around with? What kind of ideas, what kind of values are you picking up? Because it's not just people who create your mental environment, or, or actual flesh and blood people that you associate with, but you spend, you spend a lot of time with different books, different magazines, all the media. And the question you always have to ask is, why is there somebody out there who wants me to believe this? And exactly what are they asking me to believe? What assumptions am I accepting when I accept their ideas, or even start thinking in line with them? Yesterday I was talking with some businessmen who were talking about when you're in business there, you've got to be aware of people who are unscrupulous. And then, however, they're also very, you know, very scrupulous people. But then the question is, even when the scrupulous in business, what is, what are the basic assumptions in business about how to, the best way to spend your time, the best kind of values to have? You've got to question those values. Are they really in line with your own true interest? Do they clash with the Buddha's basic teaching that happiness comes from training the mind? Because there are a lot of different areas out there in the world where we could be competing with each other. Some people try to compete in being smarter. Some people compete in trying to be more wealthy, better looking, stronger, more powerful, in the sense of being able to influence a lot of people. You've always got to ask, is that really good for you? When you hang around with a group of people, what are the basic assumptions that underlie your friendship, underlie your interactions? And if you're serious about your practice, you've really got to cordon off an area of your heart through the meditation, so that when you've been dealing with people, you come back home and sit quietly and say, okay, what did I pick up? What germs of ideas did I pick up from those people? 
even something as innocent as listening to the news. There's not only the bias of the particular newscaster, but then there's a deeper bias that underlies all news that you get through the media, and that is that the most important things happening in the world right now are things other people are doing someplace else. And that right there flies in the face of the drama. The Buddha's teaching is that the most important thing in life is what you're doing right now. You want to be skillful about it. You don't want to have your, dis your attention distracted by other people's behavior. At most, you look at them in terms of examples. Is this a good example? Is this a bad example that they give? But your primary focus has to be on what are you doing right now? That's the Buddha. One of the questions the Buddha has the monks ask themselves every day. Days and nights fly past, fly past. What am I doing right now? And it's a good question not only for monks, but for all people who are trying to train the mind, trying to find a true happiness. So it is important that you ask yourself you know, who are your true friends and who are not. The Buddha gives some examples in the canon. The people you want to hang around with are one people who have conviction, i.e., they have conviction in the power of human action, power of training the mind, that it really is important. That's your action to not just throw away. You can't be apathetic about what you're doing. That's the first principle. The second one is that you want to find people who are generous. Not only because they'll be generous to you, but they also teach you generosity so that you can pick up some of that habit. If you're going to be competing with one another, learn how to compete in being generous rather than be competing in accumulation. The third prerequisite is that the people of virtue, that they have strong principles, certain types of behavior that they will not engage in because they know that it's harmful. Again, you benefit, one, because they're not going to harm you, and two, they teach you how to be harmless, and they remind you that this is important. And finally, they're wise and discerning in terms of seeing what really does cause suffering and what doesn't, what leads to true happiness and what doesn't. So those are the four qualities, conviction, generosity, virtue, discernment. When there are people in your inner circle of friends, you you benefit from having people of this sort, the people that you go to for advice, the people whose values you really feel at home with. Of course, there's a question of how many of those people can you find. And if you have trouble finding them outside, we've got to develop a set of friends inside. And this is one of the reasons John Lee, for example, talks about having the breath as your friend. It's being able to stay in touch with your breath. It helps you watch the emotions of your mind. It helps to alert you when you've picked up something, when you've picked up germs from other people. And in terms of your reading, what you listen to, read Dharma books, listen to Dharma talks. Be selective in your reading of Dharma. This is all kinds of Dharma out there, true and false. And the best way to sort out what's true and false, the Buddha gives some examples. You, true Dharma teaches you to be unburdensome. It teaches you to develop dispassion rather than passion thinking and acting in ways that will loosen your fetters rather than tie them tight, acting in ways that don't lead to entanglement, don't lead to self-aggrandizement. This is a big problem in America. There's some basic principles to watch for in your behavior and watch for in when you're trying to decide what's dharma and what's not. Just because a book says it's a dharma book doesn't mean that it is a dharma book. And conversely, there are a lot of books out there that may not be dharma books in an overt way, but they do teach good lessons. So learn to be alert to that. But 
ultimately the best test is for you to develop as much integrity and as many admirable qualities within yourself as you can. You be very clear about what your values are. If you're going to be competing with other people, you know, compete in being virtuous, compete in being generous, having conviction, being wise. John Lee tells a story about when he was a young monk competing with his other young friends you know, who could sit longer in meditation, who could walk longer in meditation, who could do with less food. It's kind of childish, but it did develop good qualities. Eventually got over the need to be competitive to measure himself against other people. But it's hard living in society not to measure yourself against other people, but learn to measure yourself in terms of the right standards. There's another passage where Ananda is talking to a nun. He says, we're practicing this practice, one, to overcome conceit, but conceit has its uses. See that other people are practicing, say, they're human beings, I'm a human being. They can do it, I can do it. So as long as there's going to be conceit in your mind, i.e. the idea that you define yourself in a certain way and you define yourself against other people in a certain way, try to use standards that are wise. Again, look in terms of generosity, virtue, conviction, discernment. At the very least, be your own best friend in terms of your values. And try to keep those values clear and articulate so that you notice when you're deviating from them. So that even though we're living here in a land of wrong views, try to create an island of right views around yourself. Sometimes here I feel like we're living in a moon colony. I have to be very careful to make sure that we stay within our support system. Carry our own, our own oxygen around with us. Okay, we'll make the, the Dharma your oxygen as best you can in terms of what you listen to, what you read, and how you sort out the germs and other things you pick up from outside. In other words, take that sense of having admirable friends and learn to internalize it so you can carry it around with you. That's one of the most important things you can do in the practice.